Well, here we are in the darkness of Christmas morning in the continental United States. It is officially Christmas Day, even though it's the middle of the night from the east to the left coast. And this is going to be Merry Christmas to Hallie Everts from Jesus Christ and the LDS Brethren in Salt Lake. I'm reviewing some things I watched on a video from Hallie Everts that uh, actually I think it's her latest video because um, I think this is really appropriate because she's talking about her religious beliefs and the importance of Jesus Christ and the atonement and how much she believes her heavenly father loves her and the LDS plan of salvation. And of course, this all relates to the mission of Jesus Christ. And most of the Christian world thinks that this is his birthday. At least that's what they've been taught due to the fact that the uh, story of Jesus seems to be developed from the uh, sun god legends of um, long, long ago. Anyway, uh, in her video, she said a lot of things that I think are really um, worth looking at. And so I wrote some notes down because we know Hallie doesn't like me to film uh, her live uh, talking. So I just do the talking, summarizing some of the things that she has said. So let's get into it. She's a daughter of God and she's got self-worth now. But she didn't at one time. Even though her loving Heavenly Father, she believes, would love her no matter what. So let's see how all this works out with LDS doctrine. Okay, so here are some of the notes that I took here. Um, Kelly starts talking about the Book of Mormon, uh, which mentions that there were people in the Book of Mormon who got puffed up in pride and they were uh, really, really concerned with material wealth and they wanted their fine twined linens and all that sort of thing. Even silk, um, which of course didn't exist in the Americas, but we're not going to talk too hard about the mistakes Joseph Smith made while he was writing this. Um, yeah, it says that they had silks and fine twined linens, which we know it's impossible since uh, silk comes from like the silkworm in Asia and they didn't have that in pre-Columbian America. But Halley focuses on how a lot of people are making up for their feelings of lack and guilt and just no self-worth by looking for things that make them look uh, more glamorous or beautiful or that sort of a thing. And she talks about how she felt inside, uh, a little subpar growing up because she felt she was a little bit overweight. But she had this relationship with her first boyfriend that uh, went so much deeper than just looks. And she felt, um, she felt cared about and she felt that she was talented with her musical uh, abilities. Uh, she played in the band in high school, that sort of a thing. So she felt cared about, and maybe she felt cared about a lot because, or, or worthwhile, because of the attention that she got from her from her boyfriend. Uh, then she goes on to say that she uh, wound up going to BYU, and there were other girls who were just as pretty and maybe a little more glamorous than she was, and they were smart and you know, anybody who knows anything about BYU knows that there are not enough places for as many people who would like to go there, so the competition's pretty stiff, and it's kind of the cream of the crop academically for members of the church, I would venture to say it's probably pretty accurate. So she she um, didn't feel like, you know, she didn't stand out as unique like her dad taught her to feel, and she was just one in the crowd and uh, not very appreciated. And what she doesn't mention here, but that she's mentioned in some other videos, is that she dumped her boyfriend 
because the church instructed her to do that. Basically, the church teaches you got to marry in the temple in order to have your family together forever. And she was all about wanting a happy together forever family, which is perfectly good and normal. But this doctrine that is taught basically caused her to destroy a relationship with someone that um, she valued and that apparently valued her. And at BYU, she was uh, just another brick in the wall, I guess. So um, she talks about the fact that, that her, because of her self-worth going down, and I think that that's partially because of what occurs in the church because of these teachings, like she had to dump someone and go to BYU to find a worthy young return missionary to marry her, basically. She went there to get her MRS degree, I suspect, along with getting, you know, some education. And she chose things that would be useful in building a family, like things about, you know, marriage and family, that sort of thing, I believe. So she was really trying hard, but she wasn't getting the kind of attention she felt she wanted or needed. And she wound up breaking the commandments uh, as are they are taught in Mormonism and also getting manipulated and used sexually uh, for the gratification of boys who would tell her nice things about herself. She's pretty, she's wonderful, she's awesome. And then use her and lose her, which is what a lot of guys do. Um, and then she said she learned basically what her daddy told her was right, that that's, guys just want one thing. Um, although, you know what, Hallie, if you ever listen to this, that's not actually true of all guys. Um, there are some of us who actually value people for who they are and love our sweethearts, um, and are not wanting to play the use them and lose them game. However, that is extremely prevalent and I have had very bad feelings for uh, a lot of guys who have really degraded girls and talked about them in ways that um, were extremely degrading and have, uh, it doesn't go over well with me either. So your dad and I probably would have said very similar things and have said very similar things. So um, Hallie felt really lousy about herself. She felt lousy because the boys basically taking advantage of her, of her emotional vulnerability, possibly. And she also had tons of guilt heaped upon her uh, because of LDS teachings regarding what a piece of crap you are if you break the law of chastity. I'm not promoting people being promiscuous, but the guilt that the church heaps upon you um, telling you it was better that you were dead than this had happened. You know, people quoting apostles saying, I, I would rather my child have been come home in a coffin dead than to have lost their virginity. And um, this, is a, this is a teaching, and there are various stories that we have been taught in church that have affected young people, uh, especially young people who have... Um, that have had relationships that went beyond what the church tells is okay in that regard and have suffered immensely in their uh, self-esteem with and emotionally and psychologically because of the guilt that's heaped upon them. So Hallie talks about the fact that she repented. And like I said, I've, I've watched other videos that she's discussed some of these issues on. So I'm not drawing all of this from this particular video, but most of it. So she winds up, you know, long story short, meeting her now husband after going through some periods of severe, you know, depression and, and horrible self-worth and then and repenting so forth, you know, so that she could be a worthy person because she's this horrible, horrible person in Mormonism because of her transgressions. And uh, so she meets uh, her husband and uh, he's kind of been uh, living the Mormon life. So she feels pretty unworthy compared to him, compares herself to, you know, 
whoever dear Johned him when he was on his mission or something like that. And she's comparing herself and she's feeling unworthy. Even though she's repented, she still feels really lousy inside, really guilty. At least that's what I'm getting out of this video that she did. So we're offered relief from guilt through the gospel uh, message. That's what we're told. We're told that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, you can have these burdens of great guilt taken away from you. Well, we probably wouldn't have these burdens of great guilt if we didn't have the gospel message in the first place. Because there are plenty of people out there uh, that I grew up with that were um, not living the Mormon lifestyle, and they didn't feel bad about it at all. So... Um, her self-worth, I think, was probably damaged by the belief system that's taught within Mormonism. So anyway, um, she did some self-evaluation. She's felt bad about herself even into her marriage uh, for a while. And in, in, in she was looking at, you know, what's good about me, what's not good about me. And then she says, well, we're here to improve. Heavenly Father loves us no matter what. Jesus would have died just for, just for her, you know, and he loves us so much, and we're just so valuable, and she's especially learned this since she has a child that she loves very, very much, and she is taught within Mormonism that, you know, no matter how much you love your child, your Heavenly Father loves you more. And so, some of the things that she's saying here, of course, don't really match with LDS doctrine very well, but that's okay. We're going to get to that. So, yeah, she says that Jesus was perfect, but, but you know, he sacrificed himself just for one person, for just for her, if it was necessary, or for you or me or anybody, and it's just, you know, marvelous. It lets us become better. The whole eternal progression thing. Um, and that Heavenly Father wants us to feel good about ourselves and, and love ourselves, but the devil wants us to feel bad about ourselves and 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 allow uh, and, and allow him to use us as a bad influence on others, so that we can all be miserable just like he is, you know, because that's a teaching within Mormonism and probably Christianity, so. If Heavenly Father wants her to feel so wonderful and she repented, how come she feel, still felt like crap? She says that when she was in her darkest time, when she was trying to change her life or, you know, realizing that she didn't feel good about what she was doing uh, to the, you know, strongest degree, she said theoretically she knew that God loved her so much, but she just couldn't feel it. So when she needed it most, where was her Heavenly Father? Well, nowhere to be found. But that's okay. Mormonism will teach us that it's just because we're so damn unworthy to have his spirit. He'll come back when we show we're worthy. You know, that and then. But she showed she was worthy. She changed her ways with regard to um, the things that she was not abiding within Mormonism. And she still felt really lousy until she started psychologically analyzing her own value as a person, and then she did, you know, decide that, you know, because she's the daughter of God, that means she has intrinsic value, and it's all the devil trying to make her feel like crap. So, um, I want to examine some of these things because it works so well for the church. These are binding mechanisms, the guilt, and then saying that we get relief through following Jesus Christ, which means obedience to his supposed representatives, the brethren in Salt Lake, and whoever they appoint as their underlings, as stake presidents and bishops and priesthood leaders and so forth. We need to obey them implicitly. That's how we show that we love Jesus and Heavenly Father and are grateful for this great sacrifice that brings us, you know, the ability to lose these horrible sins that we've got and uh, progress and become like God, which means, of course, that you can live with your, hap with your family so happily 
forever and ever, as long as you obey. So I wanted to look at a couple of these things scripturally and see how well this really works out and then look at how powerful these mechanisms are, like I said, for getting people to blindly obey those who are the leaders of the church. And it's not just within Mormonism. This happens in other churches, many churches, I'm sure. I harp a lot about, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses because they use a lot of manipulation on their people, a lot of mind control, just like the LDS brethren do. And and uh, Scientology and apparently, you know, Seventh-day Adventists have got that as well. I've been watching a little bit of Seventh-day Adventist video action lately. And it's, um, it's incredible how manipulated so many people are by what they all believe is the one true church, even though it's a different church. Many different churches do this and get their people to have spiritual experiences to uh, ratify to them that they are truly in the, uh, the one true church. So I want to look at a couple of scriptures here. She says her heavenly father loves you no matter what, but she felt like crap when she was uh, guilty of sin in her mind. And not only that, she felt like crap even after she had repented and really didn't feel better till she started doing a little of her own psychoanalyzing and deciding how to work that in with her LDS doctrine uh, to decide that she did have work. But, you know, what do the scriptures actually say about people that do the things that she is saying she did? Okay, so I'm in the Doctrine and Covenants section 76. All right, and um, we're reading about the people that wind up going to hell. At least for a while. The Book of Mormon supposedly contains the fullness of, God, of the gospel according to Jesus Christ speaking, speaking through Joseph Smith, and the Book of Mormon says you go to hell, you stay there forever. But when we get new revelation, somehow we forget to notice that the other revelation we had, which was supposedly the fullness of the gospel, somehow it's okay for Jesus not to tell the truth in that. Not to give us the whole story, but, well, actually, to say if you're going to hell forever, either it's true or it's not. So if the Book of Mormon's true, then this isn't, uh, because they don't state the same thing. I and mean, you can't just say it's a new light and knowledge, because it didn't say this is just part of the gospel. It says this is the fullness of the gospel, and you go to hell, you're staying there. But here it says, these are they who are thrust down to hell. Okay, these are they who shall not be redeemed from the devil until her, the last resurrection, until the Lord, even Christ the Lamb, shall have finished his works. Okay, so who are these people that wind up going to hell for the whole millennium and maybe another millennium, you know, according to Bruce McConkie, Jesus came in the meridian of time, so that would make a, you know, that little season after the millennium, another thousand years if you do the math, but that's okay. According to, you know, Alma the Younger, that place was so horrible where he went for three days, racked with eternal torment, he didn't want his worst enemy to go there, not even for a minute. So a thousand years or more, that's where God's going to put you if you make a few bad choices, which Halley calls mistakes. Well, what are these mistakes? Well, you know, break the law of chastity, have sex outside of marriage, that sort of thing. Or maybe you stole something once. Or, you know, maybe you just went to the wrong church. Just went to the wrong church? Am I serious? Well, actually, I am serious. Okay, so these are the people who are going to hell. And it says, for these are they who are of Paul and of Apollos, and of Cephas. These are they who say, some of them say, or one or some of another, some of Christ, some of John, you know, like the Baptist, John the Baptist, some of Moses, some of Elias, some of Isaiah, and some of Isaiah, and some of Enoch. In other words, any other church, as it says in the Book of Mormon, 1 Nephi chapter 14, they're all all churches are part of the church of the devil, except the LDS church. So they're all dragging you to hell. If you go to the wrong church, you're going to hell. 
if you do any of these naughty things, you're going to hell. Whoever loves and makes a lie, that means you get a divorce maybe, uh, unless your partner was um, committing adultery. These are they who are liars, sorcerers, adulterers, whoremongers. Doesn't even say murderers there. Maybe somewhere it does. Um, all right, well, um, Joseph Smith was a sorcerer. Um, <laughs> practice witchcraft and magic we know that and the church has basically admitted it was showing that you know his seer stone and say that he used it to do treasure seeking so that's just like using a crystal ball or a dark mirror or a Ouija board I mean that's all sorcery but that's okay um, God didn't mind he was just preparing him to be a prophet that way so he could use it to translate the Book of Mormon right they that's a little tough to explain so anyway these are they who suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. These are they who suffer the wrath of God on earth. These are they who are cast down to hell and suffer the wrath of Almighty God until the fullness of times when Christ shall have subdued all enemies under his feet and shall have perfected his work. Does that sound like your heavenly father really loves you no matter what you do? Does that sound that way to you if you're listening, Hallie Everts? Like, there's nothing you can do that he won't love you. That's what you said. And he's going to send you to, with his wrath, his hatred and anger, basically, to be burned in hell in eternal fire suffer the vengeance of eternal fire how do you reconcile that with a, a parent that loves you more than you love your own child are there any parents listening inclu including you hallie everts that would thrust your child into eternal fire for a thousand years because of anything Anything that your daughter, Ireland, could do? Is there anything she could do that you would thrust her into hell for a thousand years? But yet God loves you. Your Heavenly Father loves you more than you love your daughter. Yet I know there's no way in hell you'd do that to your daughter. You wouldn't. Um, you know, that's just... And now, look what Heavenly Father, our loving Heavenly Father, would do to me. Because I don't believe this BS anymore. And so, what does he say? We saw the visions of the suffering of those with whom he made war and overcame. For thus came the voice of the Lord unto us. Thus saith the Lord concerning all those who know my power and have been made partakers thereof and suffered themselves through the power of the devil to be overcome and to deny the truth and defy my power. They are they who are the sons of perdition of whom I say it has been it is better that for them never to have been born for they are vessels of wrath doomed to suffer the wrath of God with the devil and his angels in eternity. Concerning whom I have said there is no forgiveness in this world nor in the world to come. Having denied the Holy Spirit after having received it and having denied the only begotten Son of the Father, having crucified himself unto themselves and put him to him open shame. These are they who shall go away into the lake of fire and brimstone with the devil and his angels. You know, I just saw something on LDS.org or something where they're saying, we don't believe in fire and brimstone. Well, here it is, right in section 76 with Joseph Smith's marvelous, you know, revelation. Um, fire and brimstone... Yeah, with the devil and his angels. And this is for people who were, you know, members of the church who had received the Holy Ghost and don't buy it anymore. They, you know, people like me who read history and found out, hey, they lied to us about a lot of stuff. Joseph Smith was dishonest. He cheated on his wife 
and said that God told him to do it. You know, even though it's a covenant that according to section 132 in the Doctrine and Covenants, God says he respects that covenant until death do you part. Yet he's got God commanding him to take other men's wives for all eternity and etc., etc., etc. God has no respect for the marriage covenant, apparently. All sorts of things I found out were complete lies. So because I believe in trying to do what's right and having some integrity, I cannot believe the trash that we were taught in the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. Um, I've compared them together, and which I've done in many of these videos, and found lots of contradiction, which an all-knowing, unchanging God wouldn't have, now would he? Um, I found many lies and much intentional deception by the brethren on LDS.org in multiple web pages, uh, including, but, you know, not limited to the Gospel Topics essays, where they flat lie through their teeth. So, that's what happens to people who have some integrity and notice that they're not being told the truth, and that people are being screwed over in this church, just like they are in the Watchtower, or in the Seventh-day Adventists, or the Moonies, or Scientology, or many other organizations that trick people into believing that they are some guilty, horrible thing that just needs Jesus Christ to atone for their sins, to make up for their fallen nature of being lousy, worthless, natural men and women who are prone to sin because of our selfish ways. And the psychology works marvelously to bind people to these various organizations. And as I've listened to the uh, presentations that Hallie has made, which she does very sincerely, um, she seems like a really, really good person. She's been through a lot and she's struggled and she's trying to be just a, a good mother and a good wife. Uh, she tries to do everything healthy, you know, for her family. She tries to help support the family with her YouTubing. Um, and, and she's not afraid to basically confess or denigrate herself for things that she feels that she's done wrong in the past that were not in accordance with the LDS um, commandments that are given. And she's had all this suffering, yet she believes that this Jesus Christ myth is true and that her Heavenly Father loves her despite the fact that his actions don't show that. The commandments, the revelations that we have, teach of a God that will send most of his children to hell. Uh, for most of, you know, for, for at least some period of time. Of course, the Book of Mormon says forever. Uh, and although it's, you know, a little lighter than Christianity, which sends you there uh, and you, you can't get out with the Mormon missionaries teaching you, even in Mormonism, if you are a wonderful person, you wind up in spirit prison. And there's really only two places, the good place and the bad place. So, uh, if you read the doctrines, you went to the wrong church, you're going to be in hell until the Mormon missionaries preach to you and, and, and you can accept someone else doing a, you know, a baptism for the dead or something. So that doesn't sound like a very fair God who sends uh, people that are really horrible torturers of people uh, into a terrible place and then the same place is where good, honest people go that never got to hear about Jesus. The whole thing about Jesus is brand identity. The worst thing you can do in Mormonism is the same thing as the worst thing you can do in a lot of other Christian denominations. It's quit the church. You go again, you say Mormonism's not true, you're going to hell forever and ever. You lose your family for all eternity. Not to mention for a time, if you're a guy, they'll just tell your wife you're unworthy. She needs to find a better priesthood man so she can go to heaven, you know, keep her children. Um, the psychology that they have destroys families rather than strengthens them. The tithing 
you know, the 10% of your gross income might be 100% of what you've got left, your disposable income after handling obligations. Or it actually might exceed that. Because people are told you pay the church first. Doesn't matter if you've got a mortgage, car payment, student loan, whatever your other obligations are, forget about it until you've paid the church. And so people all over the world suffer uh, because of this. Many people in the United States have gotten used to the church helping them out with their electric bill or maybe even paying their rent a couple times if they run out of money and they pay their tithing. So they're conditioned in believing God will make a way possible. In a lot of other countries, they just say, screw you, you know, uh, sell your dog, sell, sell your furniture, sell your couch, your dining room table, you know, uh, before we're going to help you at all. Or maybe they just won't. I've watched them say, hey, look up. Yeah, just We need a collection of beans for people, you know, so they'll have some food. The church doesn't help them. Um, I mean, I've seen that happen. So it's not like a lot of people think in, in North America. They think that it is in the United States. It's, it's uh, truly not that way. We're conditioned to believe that God wants us to pay him first. He doesn't need the money. We need it to exercise faith. Sure, that's it, all right. The 501c3 corporate entity, you know, that heads this enormous corporate conglomerate, this corporate empire of many, many businesses, very profitable, doesn't need our money, or does it? Yeah, they need the money. They need the money to be becoming more and more rich and powerful and paying dividends to their shareholders, whoever owns the shares of this privately owned corporate empire is, um, or at least of the you know corporation of the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is benefiting from your tithes. And it's like Gordon B. Hinckley said about interest. He said, people that don't understand interest pay it. People that do receive it. Well, it's the same way with tithing people. It's not like the guys at the very top actually believe the stuff that they're teaching. They know it's a lie. That's why the heads of so many of these religious organizations and so many popular Christian evangel evangelists, you know, big boys, are Freemasons. High-level Freemasons, Luciferians. They absolutely don't believe the BS that they peddle to the masses who buy this stuff about God being some guy who created the earth in six days and sends most of his children to hell but still loves us so much that um, created the rest of the universe on the fourth day of creation of this world and that somehow was uh, excited about having animals butchered and burned on altars to make him feel good enough to forgive your sins until Jesus Christ comes along, and then he accepts him being murdered for you in order for him to forgive you. If he's all-powerful, obviously he could forgive you without needing a blood sacrifice. But, you know, and the Romans came up with this Jesus mythology, they had to find a way to work it in with Judaism, which required blood sacrifice, as many primitive religions have and continue to this day to. If you really think about it, it's completely absurd that an all-powerful being would require animals murdered or his own, you know, supposedly top cream of the crop, most innocent child murdered in order to forgive you. He could just forgive you. So at this point, I'd just like to wish the very best to Hallie Everts and her family um, for this time that she calls Christmas and everybody else, all of our, everybody that views these videos and comments. I appreciate uh, a lot of the participation that we get um, in, in the comment section and so forth. And it's, uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to share truth, and it's a good thing not to hate people because they believe something different. And it's good to be honest about what the church teaches and realize, well, you know what? They haven't been honest with us. And if the truth would harm 
the church, then it ought to be harmed, like uh, J. Reuben Clark said, and like we find in Jeremy Rennell's uh, CES letter. So there we have it. I'm probably going to be working on a website to actually do uh, put some written things down because I, I, I have some things that I differ on from Jeremy and his CES letter or from the letter to an apostle and actually I haven't even read all the way through the letter to my wife uh, deal which I probably should have done something on but uh, all of these have got some things that are important and, and, and they've all got some things or at least two of them have things that I don't personally agree with um, myself uh, appeasing the Christians by dropping the part about out of the Bible in Jeremy's CES 2.0 um, you know that's I'm sorry but the Bible is uh, filled with this whole Jesus Christ myth that's enslaved so many people and harmed so many people and caused so much bloodshed over the years and uh, you know he wants to take that out and appease the Christians if that's what he's doing which is what it appears to me to be then you know I think there's a need for something else to be said on a couple of different subjects. However, he's done a wonderful job on a lot of stuff. He's real light on the Freemasonry in there, and I've got probably a lot more uh, insight into Freemasonry than he does, so good. I'll I'll include more of that now. I think I'll make it so we can link up videos with the various subjects and try to make a, a resource that I think is... Um, even more useful than what we've got so far with the videos. So I want to try to create something that helps free people from the bondage that they are in, especially through the mind control exercise through religious organizations such as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. At this point, since it's Christmas Day, I'm going to probably just uh, play some excerpts out of... Uh, some things I put in some other videos um, regarding how we got the Jesus myth. So along those lines, I thought I'd mention um, Caesar's Messiah and uh, the Flavian family inventing the Jesus myth to control people and to mellow the Jews out. So they wouldn't be looking for this Messiah, which means a military leader. Uh, that's why gospel, you know, has been reinterpreted to mean good news. When we know it really, gospel means good news of military victory. The military victory was had by Titus Flavius over the Jews. And we find that the battles of Titus Flavius seem to be mirrored in allegory by the stories in the gospels where Jesus happens to go in his ministry. He just goes everywhere in the same sequence that Titus Flavius had in his battles against the Jews, uh, which ended you know, around 70 AD. And we got our first Gospels a little later than that, and then some of them are between 90 and 110 AD. So these guys weren't even, you know, the, whoever wrote this stuff, um, you know, they, they obviously wouldn't have been likely with the lifespans that they had at that time close to 50 years if you're lucky even be alive or you know close to adult or something to be in the stories that they're in in other words the pen the pen names like you know matthew mark luke and john these guys are you know mostly guys that are in the stories that they're writing about many years after it would have taken place had they actually been real people um, I also want to mention, you know, kind of along the lines that Hallie Everts was talking about the Book of Mormon saying all these people were all into the things of the world. And besides the anachronism of mentioning, like, you know, fine twine loons and silk, you know, things that, you know, especially silk, since obviously they couldn't have had that since they didn't have silkworms. Um, that the Book of Mormon teaches that people who, you know, don't believe in the church of God are wicked, prideful. The Nephites are, you know, they're all going through these pride cycles. They're good and they obey and then, you know, then they get rich or they start making money and then they're all jerks and, and they leave the church. And anybody who leaves the church is just wicked. They want to take advantage of people and, you know, be party animals or whatever. And we find that that isn't necessarily the case in reality. I mean, the Book of Mormon's, you know, 
talking about fantasy people that obviously never existed, as we know from the DNA studies, and that the people that came across, say, you know, 15,000 years ago, obviously were long before Adam and weren't washed away by Noah's flood. So it destroys Genesis and, you know, the rest of Mormon theology along with it. But people that, you know, leave the church now, yeah, you know, some of them do leave because they just want to drink and party and do whatever. And then there are plenty of people that stay in the church that are doing that anyway, especially in the singles program, you know, that are getting around town uh, or marrying and divorcing, marrying and divorcing. You know, there's all kinds of immoral things that go on in the LDS singles uh, groups. But people that leave the church, some of them leave for various other reasons. And a lot of people are leaving the church because they found out through study and information is more readily available. Now it's more difficult for the church to exercise its tyrannical grip on information to let us see that actually Brigham Young taught things much different. Joseph Smith taught things plus what's in the scriptures and that are not congruent with what are being taught now that we've been lied to about the history, about their conduct. You know, that Joseph Smith was basically running the criminal organization similar to the mafia and uh, was taking so much advantage of so many women that they had human trafficking going on in Nauvoo with this spiritual life system with the hundreds and hundreds of women that were enslaved to Joseph Smith and his cohorts. And the church, of course, conveniently frames the argument around something completely different from that and talks about polygamy, which is what Brigham Young did, you know, and then they try to justify this, these so-called sealings. Joseph Smith uh, always lied about Section 132 and said it didn't even exist. And he was uh, getting his way with lots of women long before he came up with that one. He used the Hosea chapter 3 doctrine to talk all these girls into bed. So the things we're taught about people that leave the church just tell us that they're wicked and horrible. And, you know, guys like me that realize that this is a bunch of malarkey and say something about it, or, you know, we're just tools of the devil doomed to suffer his wrath in hell forever and ever in fire and brimstone with the devil and his angels because we try to help people know that they're being lied to and made to feel bad about things and made to pay money to this huge corporation, you know, telling them that God wants them to do this crap and to, to be missionaries and to serve, serve, serve the corporate empire. And it's horrible and ridiculous. And that just makes us wicked, you know. Adolf Hitler will wind up in the celestial kingdom after he suffers in hell, but I'll be in outer darkness and suffering in fire and brimstone forever because I tried to help people while Adolf Hitler, you know, tried to get what he wanted and didn't care how many people he killed. So that's our Heavenly Father. That's his way of doing things. That's how much he loves us. And so... This, uh, the, the, this uh, Caesar's Messiah stuff is uh, pretty interesting. The more you look into the development of the myth of Jesus, the more obvious it gets that they just made this dude up. And obviously no Jew would name their child Jesus Christ. Um, the more you look at it, the more ridiculous the whole thing is. I've studied where, where the New Testament books came from and that sort of a thing. You know, the books of Paul, St. Paul, were written long before the Gospels. How's that work, huh? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the only Jesus that the Jews believed in was an angel named Jesus that got murdered by Satan up in the heavens. Uh, but you don't hear that in Sunday school. Nice picture. So, I want to play some excerpts that I put from the zeitgeist into uh, this video, which is called My Journey from Atheist Child to Believe Biblical Christianity. Maybe I ought to show what it says there. Actually, I don't even think I can see the whole label here. To Believe Biblical Christianity and... Mormonism and find out it's all BS in the end, I guess. Uh, probably easier to see in the other venue here. Because it's a pretty good video. And uh, like I said, 
the coming up with the uh, God of Mormonism through um, solar worship um, is pretty interesting. And there is so much that we can learn about the invention of Judaism and Christianity and find out where we got this stuff from. Because the more you think about it, the less sense it makes. My journey from atheist child to believe biblical Christianity and Mormonism and then discover, yeah, that it's all BS. It's a pretty good video, and I'm going to maybe just put a little bit of it in here, some excerpts regarding where we get this myth of Jesus. What I do bring you is a message called How I Went from Atheist Child to Biblical Christianity to Mormonism to Son of Perdition. By degrees. So I've done, <clears throat> well obviously I've done hundreds of videos this year. I started on New Year's Day. So we've gone 10 months and about 13 days at this point. And uh, I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ, as Gordon B. Hinckley used to say. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a little bit about my journey. Now, we know that I've done the My Journey Part 1 that got to a certain point and related a lot of spiritual experiences and that sort of a thing uh, in, a, in a lot of my trek. And for October, that was my number one video as far as minutes viewed, even though it was a couple hours long and somebody said, how does anybody watch these things so long? I think people like stories. They like to know how you came to learn certain things. And I learned a lot of things by deconstruction. And that's really the key of where this is going to, is going to, is going to come from. So um, <clears throat> I didn't just listen to the stuff that I had formerly said. So um, at this point, I wanted to talk about how I began to notice that things weren't the way that I'd been told. So I'll do a little, a, a little quick little overview of, uh, of, of, of um, the first part of this, and then I'm going to spend more time on the deconstructive portion because I've spent already time in the other videos, in, in that, that one particular video, a lot on the first part of this. So, Okay, so I'm just going to get to the Jesus Christ myth and the solar deity uh, information in here and we'll probably have a surprise ending as far as you know running out of phone memory goes so I don't know where this is going to end exactly I may not get through the portion that I'm going to try to put in here all right so this portion came out of the zeitgeist and uh, enjoy This is the sun. As far back as 10,000 BC, history is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth, and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness. Did anybody notice the date? Did he say 10,000 BC? Without it, the cultures understood the crops would not grow and life on the planet would not survive. These realities make the sun the most adorned object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. 
It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or God, God's son, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the 12 constellations represented places of travel for God's son and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun, anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set. And Set was the personification of the darkness, or night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Let me just mention that briefly. The whole thing of the balance of the opposites is a teaching that we find in the mystery schools in the Egyptian and most likely in the Babylonian as well. And we find in Freemasonry and we find within Mormonism. Speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, which, in turn, three kings followed to locate and adorn the newborn savior. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher. At the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the truth, the light, God's anointed son, the good shepherd, the lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the Virgin Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And upon his death, he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th, he had 12 dis Do you see the rays of the sun? just like Lady Liberty? Do we see the halo in back, just like we see in the back of Apollo and Jesus? In various pictures? Just thought I'd point that out. Disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the truth, the light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why 12 disciples or followers? To find out, let's
Let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn the new savior. He was a child teacher at 12. At the age of 30, he was baptized by John the Baptist, and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples, which he traveled about with, performing miracles, such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days, was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which, on December 24th, aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the Three Kings follow the star in the east, in order to locate the sunrise, the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. The ancient glyph for Virgo is the altered M. This is why Mary, along with other virgin mothers, such as Adonis' mother Myra, or Buddha's mother Maya, begin with an M. Virgo is also referred to as the house of bread, and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to house of bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on Earth. There's another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolize the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. But the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death, and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter. This is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the 12 disciples. They are simply the 12 constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. In fact, the number 12 is replete throughout the Bible. This text has more to do with astrology than anything else. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. 
It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the Zodiac. This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross. For Jesus is the Son, the Son of God, the light of the world, the risen Savior who will come again as it does every morning. The glory of God who defends against the works of darkness as he is born again every morning and can be seen coming in the clouds up in heaven with his crown of thorns or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. Throughout the scriptures, there are numerous references to the age. In order to understand and this, we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. The ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox would occur in a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow, angular wobble that the Earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a precession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the precession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year. And ancient societies were very aware of this, and they referred to each 2150-year period as an age. From 4300 BC to 2150 BC, it was the age of Taurus, the bull. From 2150 BC to 1 AD, it was the age of Aries, the ram. And from 1 AD to 2150 AD, it is the age of Pisces, the age we are still in to this day. And in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshipping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshipping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Ares the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Ares, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Ares, the age of Pisces, or the two fish. I believe that the followers of Mithra drank bread and water, drank, ate bread and drank water in their ritual which was basically like their sacrament or <clears throat> the transubstantiation of cannibalizing their god, if I remember correctly. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we have all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the next Passover will be after he is gone, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. 
Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer, who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the Son, God's Son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, the main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true, as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3,500 years ago on the walls at the Temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Immaculate Conception, the birth and the adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the virgin, and then the virgin birth and the adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. And the plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove, all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. I might note here that this was one of the things that I checked into, since, you know, 
Christians are always arguing how many animals you can get on the ark and people of a scientific community may be arguing that you can't fit enough animals on the ark plus have room for food and all sorts of other really nutty things that would have to actually take place like you know your kangaroos hop all the way to Australia they're gonna hop on water you know oh but we have the biblical account says that you know <clears throat> maybe it's a hundred years after the ark uh, lands on Mount Ararat that uh, in the days of Peleg who I believe is like five generations from Noah the earth was divided of course it's like 60 million years ago or something you know something hugely different uh, in in the scientific community but what you can notice however is that this the Sumerians the Babylonians the Egyptians you know they kept records of their their civilizations of things of their goings on and they weren't washed away in 2344 BC in other words 250 years after what they're dating this uh, epic of Gilgamesh to is supposed to be when the flood of Noah occurred and the you know Jeffrey uh, Holland <laughs> expounds upon this in his promised land talk that I've referenced multiple times um, you know, he's talking about in the, it sucks, in, in the Book of Mormon, it says, when the waters receded from the land, it became the promised land. And then he goes on to say that, you know, then God divided the lands and water rushed around the Americas to keep, make sure nobody came to the Americas except God brought them there. And uh, so we've gone into detail on that. And, on, and, and of course, noting that the American Indians, the Native Americans, are said to have come across in the Bering Straits about 15,000 years ago, long before Adam, and were not washed away by any flood. And, of course, the church, you know, the, the narrative when, when we had the Book of Mormon come out was like, hey, we've got these American Indians here, that's how they got here, they came from Israel, um, and, and, and so forth. But now with the DNA studies, of course, that didn't work out too well since, you know, what, 199 out of every 200 people that they test positively show they came from Siberia and the other ones really you know I don't know maybe they they migrated or something I don't know but they don't they don't show from Israel any of them uh, actually there are some Cherokees that's supposed to have some, some something that they think might be you know from the Middle East or something like that but anyway the narrative of course has changed in the Book of Mormon and in the gospel topic essays the excuse is oh they disappeared into this vast existing population that was in the Americas, which of course was contrary to what we were told in the Book of Mormon, contrary to what the Lord's apostles have been telling us, um, either they were washed away or they weren't. So obviously they weren't. And when we looked in the Bible Dictionary, you know, LDS Bible Dictionary, and we found on LDS.org or the back of your scriptures, you take a look at Egypt, and contrary to what it says in the Book of Abraham about Egypt being repopulated by Egyptus and her sons post-flood, the Bible dictionary goes with the theme that, oh yeah, you know, in 3000 BC we had things getting started there, and then by the time we got to the 18th dynasty in 1700 BC, this is what was happening, and it's like, so like, uh, how do we get to the 18th dynasty if the people were washed away with a flood? You know, they just kind of <coughs> ignore all that. In other words, they're giving us um, something that's somewhat historically accurate, and the Egyptians weren't washed away. As everybody should know, they have plenty of records uh, going through that period. American Indians weren't washed away, the Egyptians weren't washed away, the Chinese weren't washed away, the Babylonians weren't washed away, all sorts of city-states that kept records in the Middle East weren't washed away. The biblical flood is phony. Just like the creation story. Just like the Book of Mormon, which says that the Bible story was true and then there is the plagiarized story of moses upon moses's birth it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide he was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince 
This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid... 2250 BC. Once again, there wouldn't have been any kingdoms in 2250 BC if there were only eight people on earth a hundred years before that, now would there? And they wouldn't have been doing battle with other kingdoms and taking them over and all these things. Like I said, there's history. They weren't washed away. Everything you teach your children in primary is just a big, fat lie. Fantasied and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets, and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased, I have not stolen, became thou shalt not steal. I have not killed, became thou shalt not kill. I have not told lies, became thou shalt not bear false witness, and so forth. In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. Baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Covenant, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many, many more are all attributes of Egyptian ideas long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, wrote, When we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. In a different writing, Justin Martyr said, he was born of a virgin. Accept this in common with what you believe of Perseus. It's obvious that Justin and other early Christians knew how similar Christianity was to the pagan religions. However, Justin had a solution. As far as he was concerned, the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world. Apparently that didn't bother Joseph Smith too much. He had the Jupiter magic talisman on his person when he was shot. And Hiram had the holiness to the Lord, you know, like we see on the temple. Holiness to the Lord, magical parchment on him at the time. Because they were magicians, sorcerers, and gangsters of the meanest sort running a criminal enterprise in Nauvoo that enslaved actually hundreds of women in the spiritual life system. The Danites are <clears throat> known to have completed many, many murders. The confessions of John D. Lee are replete with stories of um, very incriminating nature. He was a Danite and Brigham was the Grand Archie after Joseph Smith's death. He does talk about many hits that went on, and uh, of course he was the one who uh, was <clears throat> the scapegoat for the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Not that he wasn't involved, but it came down from the priesthood. When we see what Joseph Jackson had to say about the Danites when he rode with them in his undercover mission to find out what was going on with Joe Smith and the Mormons, the counterfeiting operation in Nauvoo, the spiritual wife system, the Danites, the murders, the hit on the governor, Boggs, that uh, Joe's, Joseph Smith put on him, and Porter Rockwell was jailed because he shot him, but he didn't kill him, 
and they never found the weapon, and uh, he eventually uh, was let loose. But uh, Joseph Smith hired Joseph Jackson to get Porter Rockwell back and to finish the job on Governor Boggs. At least that's the way it's <clears throat> found in Joseph H. Jackson's sworn testimony. theological literary hybrid just like nearly all religious myths before it in fact the aspect of transference of one character's attributes to a new character can be found within the book itself in the old testament there is the story of joseph joseph was a prototype for jesus joseph was born of a miracle birth jesus was born of a miracle birth joseph was of 12 brothers jesus had 12 disciples Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Brother Judah suggests the sale of Joseph. Disciple Judas suggests the sale of Jesus. Joseph began his work at the age of 30. Jesus began his work at the age of 30. The parallels go on and on. Furthermore, is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers? I have seen some disputation of some of those assertions. Um, in fact, Joseph didn't have 12 brothers, so there are a few things that are wrong, but unlike the situation where Jesus has to be honest all the time or else he's not God and violates his own rules, these guys aren't claiming to be God. And we don't need to throw out everything that they say if they do have some things that are not, in fact, correct. What we do need to do is evaluate evidence. And what I've seen is a lot of evidence that it isn't the way they tell us in Sunday school. Unfortunately, I taught a lot of Sunday school. Healing people and the like, there are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. Okay, How let's look at that. Whatever to be fair. Alright, not that great of a picture. Alright, so what they had a 20 or two dozen of these historians and they never noticed Jesus. Just like the many people that supposedly witnessed the resurrection of these many people. Many saints arose and appeared unto many, but we don't have any record of that. We have the storybook that the Romans gave us. And everywhere Jesus went turns out to be everywhere they say Jesus went in the story that was written like, what, 60 years after? He would have been dead. Um, and then, you know, backdated or whatever. Uh, what do we find? We find everywhere Jesus goes in these things it happens to coincide with the war, you know, the battles between the, uh, the Romans and the Jews uh, in, in, in the uprising around 70 AD. There's a strict correlation there where they write Jesus into an existing story, just like it appears Joseph Smith may have done in certain areas of the Book of Mormon with other existing stories, whether it be the conquest of Mexico or travels of Marco Polo or wherever some of these stories may come from possibly. They certainly resemble greatly in a lot of detail other stories. Strange, huh? Air, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and Tacitus are the first three. 
Each one of their entries consists of only a few sentences at best, and only refer to Christus or the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title, it means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and perform the wealth of miracles acclaimed it. Might have some witnesses. Josephus, called Flavius Josephus, I've mentioned him before. The Flavian family, a ruling family in Judea, supposedly by the story, adopted this fellow who had been a Jew to write all this uh, history of the Roman War, which is very useful in noting the things I just said. It coincides with Jesus as though he's been written into the storyline. And would have made it into the historical record. It didn't because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. We don't want to be unkind, but we want to be factual. We don't want to call. Did we see who's written writing this? It's Thomas Paine, who wrote The Age of Reason, who also basically helped start the American Revolution when he wrote Common Sense. He may have been an Illuminist. He appears to be rather brilliant in the reading I've done of him. I think he's a pretty intelligent guy. This is what he concluded. The Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun. Looks like I'm running low on memory here. Cause hurt feelings. But we want to be academically correct in what we understand and know to be true. Christianity just is not based on truth. We find that Christianity was in fact nothing more than a Roman story developed politically. The reality is, Jesus was the solar deity of the Gnostic Christian sect. And like all other pagan gods, he was a mythical figure. It was the political establishment that sought to historize the Jesus figure for social control. By 325 AD in Rome, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. It was during this meeting that the politically motivated Christian doctrines were established. And thus... However, the Jesus story was very politically useful early on because it was creating the pacifist messiah to replace the Judean... <clears throat> Uh, belief that they were looking forward towards a regular messiah, a military hero to free them from the oppression of Rome. So there's every logical reason for the Roman establishment to create the Jesus myth, to divide Judaism, if possible, against itself. A tactic we found continuously employed by those who actually run things in our world, whether it's Republicans versus Democrats, Catholics versus Protestants, Christians versus Islam, nations versus nations, it is very useful in their strategy of control and very profitable. And what we find is people who are parts of this mystery religion, not Christianity, but those who rule over Christianity and other religions and are generally associated with Freemasonry that are the heads of society, that are the heads of religions, that are the heads of NGOs, that are the heads of banking concerns and other large conglomerates. 
began a long history of Christian bloodshed and spiritual fraud. And for the next 1600 years, the Vatican maintained a political stranglehold on all of Europe, leading to such joyous periods as the Dark Ages, along with enlightening events such as the Crusades and the Inquisition. Christianity, along with all other theistic belief systems, is the fraud of the age. It serves to detach the species from the natural world, and likewise each other. It supports blind submission to authority. It reduces human responsibility to the effect that God controls everything, and in turn, awful crimes can be justified in the name of divine pursuit. And most importantly, it empowers those who know the truth but use the myth to manipulate and control societies. The religious myth is the most powerful device ever created and serves as the psychological soil upon which other myths can flourish. A myth is an idea that, while widely believed, is false. In a deeper sense, in the religious sense, a myth serves as an orienting and mobilizing story for a people. The focus is not on the story's relation to reality, but on its function. A story cannot function unless it is believed to be true in the community or the nation. It is not a matter of debate. If some people have the bad taste, to raise the question of the truth of the sacred story, the keepers of the faith do not enter into debate with them. They ignore them or denounce them as blasphemers. It is wrong, blasphemous, and sinful for you to suggest, imply, or help other people come to the conclusion that the U.S. government killed 3,000 of its own citizens. Well, what we find, as it is also written into the Book of Mormon, that the religious leaders in our reality correspond to the Amalekites in the Book of Mormon who were set upon towers to call for patriotism, to call for the Lamanites to take up arms against the Nephites, to stir them up to war against the Nephites. And that seems to be a primary task of the Christian leaders, including those in Mormonism. And I've dissected Gordon B. Hinckley's War and Peace talk and show how he used psychological manipulation to get us to associate the Gadianton robbers with the people in Iraq that the U.S. forces went and bombed who had nothing to do with the Twin Towers, even in the most fantastical fantasy. What we find is that myths are built upon and pretended to be fact and then we see interjections such as, The Lord said this to Joseph Smith. Moroni said this in the record of the Nephites. When these things are clearly shown to be fantasies, and we've done that in the other videos, but these things are built upon, established as a fact, in the minds of people, like Noah's Ark, or any of these other things, and then built upon. Thus making it more and more difficult for people to break the bonds because they're built upon a false reality. Just like they said here, it's difficult for a church apologist, for instance, to debate actual facts. They're always trying to poke at something, poke at something, and they'll switch to another argument or come up with some absolutely ridiculous um, concept like well, Joseph Smith wasn't having sex with all those other guys wives they just wanted to be sealed to him or a skin of blackness isn't a sign of divine disfavor or a curse even though it says so in the Book of Mormon even though it says in the Book of Moses that that, that when these guys got turned black they were despised of all people and that the children of Cain were black therefore they couldn't live with any of the and so we say, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Let's read. A 
a poem that I did for this one called Mormonism, Babylonian Mystery School Roots, and America's Manifest Destiny as the New Atlantis. As we look in the description, we'll pull up one little poem here. I wasn't really in it there, and I'm really in it now. Considering the occult roots of America is her manifest destiny, the new Atlantis, her unhallowed hand holding Lucifer's light, she stands in the bay as the queen of the night. A mother of gods from the ages of old. In Columbia's hand the times are foretold. In liberty's name by Freemasons given. Desolation she brings to all nations under heaven. She's Diana to some and Isis to others. A torch in her hand, and Lilith, her mother. As Venus, she rises in dawn's early light. Or Atlantis, she watches, her goal is in sight. An order of ages long lost in the past. It's dawn she now heralds in triumph at last. She being Lady Liberty in the bay. If you get bored today, watch this one. The Halloween poem came in the night, just pre dawn, and then I published this video. Mormonism's Babylonian Mystery School Roots and America's Manifest Destiny as the New Atlantis. Ciao.